Very warm greetings to all in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, as we go through life as believers, we are constantly committing sin. We realise that. I think we realise that less than we actually sin. The Christian must know that we are constantly sinning. Even right now, some of us may not be, be even aware that we have an irreverential spirit. We have a cold and callous spirit in worship. That is sin. Do we even realize that? When you go to work, there may, things, there may be things that you think of, that you say, without even realizing that they are sins. Sometimes later on, then you realize. In school, likewise. In the home, likewise. Now, as the Christian lives, the Christian life on earth is a progressive sanctification life. What is progressive sanctification? It means as you live, you progressively become more and more holy. Holy means you separate yourself from sin, right? So as you live your Christian life, you will begin to realize some teachings. I never realized that was sin. Right? You first got saved, you never realized that, well, well, white lies are actually still lies. They are sinful. They are deception, deception, full stop. Then you begin to realize. But all your life, as a young Christian, you think that it's fine. So you're progressively flee, um, being sanctified by the Word of God. So we live in many sins. Now that is why we are very thankful. We are very thankful that salvation is by grace alone. Because if salvation is dependent on us to obey God, and we know that we are often sinning without even realizing, we have no hope. God knows that. So salvation is purely by grace, and we put our faith in that grace. Well, maybe you are someone here thinking that, well, if I attend church long enough as an elderly, I will go to heaven. If I do something for God, well, I have a chance to go to heaven. He should be receiving me into heaven. Salvation is not by you doing anything at all. So we are thankful that salvation is by grace. If not, none of us will be saved because there are so many sins that in a moment we are sinning that we don't even know about. Now that is called, those are called sins of ignorance. Sins of ignorance means, well, we, number one, did not know those were sins. We commit them. We didn't know that. Thank God that Christ paid for all our sins. And then there are also sins that, well, we are committing and we, did not, we are not even sensitive to it. We know those are sins, but we don't realize that we are doing it at that very moment. Maybe something till, till later than you realize. Sins of ignorance. Sins of ignorance. There are still sins. Please don't think that there are not sins. Now today we want to learn from this passage. So we want to revisit this passage and learn another aspect of the Christian life, the Christian living. Now, we have sins of ignorance, but I want you to please look at <clears throat> verse 13. All right? Now, God says of Eli, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever, for the iniquity which he knoweth. The iniquity which he knoweth. Now, this is not a sin of ignorance. So, in the Bible, it does tell us that there are sins that we ignore. He knew. He knew. But he continued in it. So, sins of ignorance are very different. Or I should say, ignoring sin that we know about is very different from sins of ignorance. The Christian must be conscious of that. Today's title is Ignoring Sins. Ignoring Sins. We want to learn from this passage because we want to learn what is, what is it like when we ignore sins? How does God view it? That's the first thing. Eli, God says, knew. Means 
deep down in him, deep down in him, he was conscious of it. Now, the first thing about sins or about ignoring sin is this. We presumptuously ignore, push aside, grief the Holy Spirit when He convicts us of sin. So Christian, when you and I, through the day, begin to have well, discomfort about something that we do, we say, or we've been having in our lives, please know something. God says, you know, means he, God does not um, judge you, deal with you, based on you do not know, all right? The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit works conviction in our hearts. He brings to remembrance the things that we learn. But when we think that, well, we, we just conveniently, ah, never mind, it's okay. Now, that is ignoring sin. Have you experienced that through the day, students? You go to school, you play with your friends, you say certain things, you do certain things, you think certain things. Well, adults, likewise, you go to work, you, felt you engage with your colleagues, or you do certain things at work. Well, somehow in your heart, you know, this, this is not good. This is wrong. This is sin. But you just push it aside and you continue in it. Don't take this lightly. God says, Eli knew. You know, I know. So friends, the Bible says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit by which you are sealed to the day of redemption. When God says this, He is telling us that we do that. We do grieve the Holy Spirit. We do ignore His work in our lives. God sent messengers. Here, God sent messenger to Eli. We read that earlier in chapter 2. Now, when God says he knew, he, this is not something that is new to Eli. It means for some time already, Eli knew that he has not been the father and the priest, the high priest that he should be. He knew. So it's been coming to him again and again, but he just carried on in what he was failing in. God sent Eli to his own sons. If you look at chapter 2, we read that. Eli spoke to his sons, but his sons ignore the messenger. Right? So God sent a, a, a sinning messenger to, a, to, a, um, to the sinners. Now, sometimes it's like that. But God sent the prophet also. God sent his word, not just his word, but God sent messengers, the true prophet, showing you your sin, so as you grow in your Christian life, you begin to learn new things. That this is sin, but you just, well, I've been living like that for so long, never mind. So that's the first attitude of ignoring sin. Presumptuously, just carrying on in it and say, never mind. Even though God shows you, even though in your heart, you begin to feel that conscience <coughs> pricking you, but you ignore. Too busy to think. Too much to do. If I, <coughs> if I deal with this, it's too painful. I just carry on ignoring sins. Now, the second thing we learn from here about ignoring sins is in verse 13. Look at verse 13. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. So that is the first part of ignoring sin. You know, but you don't care. Because his sons made themselves a vow and he restrained them not. So the second thing about ignoring sin is he restrained them not. Means he did not do anything. You see, sometimes we can, well, we ignore sins. But sometimes, after some time, we deal with it. But now God says, He knew and He doesn't deal with it. That is the meaning of ignoring sins. He just presumptuously continued in it. Now, yes, look at verse 13. Yes, His sons were guilty. The, his sons made themselves vow. But the key word here to to note is, and he restrained them not. You cannot say, well, I can't help it. They are grown up. He can't say that. Because God is the one saying, he did not restrain his sons who are fully grown adults. Why? Because he is not only just their father. 
He was the high priest. The only person that could stop them, the only person that could remove the priest is none other than the high priest. He not only ignored in his heart when he knew that he needed to do something, he just ignored acting in total. He ignored acting. You know, in the Bible, very often you hear Christians say, there are two um, descriptions. One they say, sins of omission and sins of commission. When they read Paul saying, the things that I should do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, that I should not do, I do. All right? Sins of omission means the things that you ought to do, that you know you ought to do, but you don't do it. Omit it. Sins of commission, the things that you need to do, uh, the things that you, you should do, you don't do. The things that you should do, all right? Not acting on sin. God makes it very clear. You are ignoring sin in your life by not acting. We will see some examples and ask ourselves whether we are guilty of those later on. So no one can blame situation. No one can blame others when we don't act. Now I want you to think about this, all right? Think about this. If God holds Eli responsible for not acting on the behavior of someone else, how much more would God hold us responsible for not acting on something that is totally in our control, which is me, ourselves. I am fully in control of my own life in that sense. I am the one that can restrain me. I am the one who knows what are the sins in my life. Now, if God says, he, yes, his sons made themselves vow, but Eli did not restrain them. Now, when we make ourselves vow and we do not restrain ourselves, that is the worst state. So Christian ignoring sins bears this kind of behavior. What kind of parenting are you exhibiting at home? We'll talk a bit, a bit more afterwards. What about as a church? Can the church ignore sins? Can the pastor, can the church elders, leaders ignore sin and think that it is fine? We cannot because God says the whole sacrificial system is corrupt because, because of the spiritual leaders. So is BPCWA going to learn from this? Not deal with sin when there is present in the congregation or in the leadership? We cannot. We must restrain. All right? Stop sin. Now then, there is another attitude of us when we ignore sins. All right? Very conveniently. Now, I want you to please look at chapter, chapter um, 3. Now, look at um, verse 17. Verse 17. And he, and he, Eli, and he said, What is the thing that the Lord has said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more so also, if ye hide anything from me of all the things that he has said unto thee. Now, Eli is, is very good here. Eli is teaching Samuel to be a true prophet. Eli is saying, now whatever God says, I'm trying to teach you. You make sure that you say it as God told you and nothing should be left out. So Eli was really teaching him to be the right kind of priest, the right kind of prophet. But I don't think he knew that everything that God said was about him. Right, after he said that, oh, about me. Now, what is the lesson to learn? Eli was ready to ignore his own sin, but quick to look at other people's sin, quick to look at other people's behavior, and want to correct people and, and tell people how to behave. Please know that. Now, what did he do with Hannah? Hannah was praying. They say, come on, woman, why are you drunk? You should not be drunk. That kind of thing, right? 
So all the while with the God says he knew, he knew the iniquity. All the while with that, we are very quick to ignore our own. Because the more we look at other people's sin, the more we feel, well, he should do this, that she should do that, we ignore our own sin. It's very convenient. We feel much better about ourselves. Well, the New Testament reminds us before you want to remove the moat from your brother's eye, that small little speck, remove the beam. Eh? See the beam in your own eye first. That is the attitude, right? So now when we analyze our life, are we like that? Are we like that? When we hear a sermon now, oh, I think that person needs that sermon. We rarely look at ourselves. So these are some of the attitudes that we need to be very careful of. We know, but we just ignore and just keep going on in it. And we don't act. And instead, we just keep thinking my life is fine and looking at others and trying to correct others. Parents, are you like that? Are you like that? Children, are you like that? All right? You're always thinking of your parents' failures, but you never look at your own. Parents, likewise. Church leaders, congregation, the same. It's very easy to let ourselves feel all right because we are trying to help someone else, someone else in their sin, right? So be careful of these things. Now, then we go to the next thing. So we know the attitude, the behaviors we can ex exhibit. So what? Well, we come to the second point. Having learned the kind of attitude and behavior we can exhibit, the second point is the warnings. The warnings for ignoring sins. The warnings. God says that Samuel knew. Look at chapter th 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3, now verse 11. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. Do you know what God is saying here? Look carefully. Both ears... Both years, what God is going to do to, to Eli, both years of all Israelites are going to hear. Both years means this. Where, however you turn, all right? You turn this way, you hear. You turn the other way, you hear. Wherever you go, you hear it. You cannot avoid knowing it. In other words, you will come to know it. And God says, I'm going to do what I've warned him about. Christian, the reason why we need to take note of this message is, is this. God says, I will want all Israelites to know. Because when the Christian ignores sin, eventually, eventually, there is a limit to which God will be patient, will tolerate, will be long-suffering. God says, he has come to a stage he has come to this stage where I am going to do this. I don't think that Eli would ever imagine that what God was going to do to him was actually going to happen, and especially that the whole line, the priesthood line, will shift away from his line totally. Now, that is the warning to each Christian. God is love, yes. But please know, when you read scriptures, even here, there will come a point where it says, enough is enough. I will act. I will act. It was a sad ending for Eli and his sons. Now, when we fail, when we ignore sin, fail as parents, fail as believers, we must not go on thinking that, well, um, you know, God is infinite in his love and we keep thinking that well he's not going to do something so serious maybe that was in Eli's mind it can't be so serious right? you know shifting the whole line as you read in chapter 2 out of Eli's house is something that will cause the years to tingle means the people will say really seriously the high priest line is the, the, most, the most prestigious. It's almost to people, well, you have to be born into this line to be a high priest and to be a priest. <clears throat> these, things, these things are really huge. Well, there will come a time where God will act. 
So Christian, don't keep ignoring sins. Don't keep refusing to, to deal with sin. Don't keep, just keep looking at other people and think about other people's sin when we don't deal with our own because, well, God will judge. God will judge. God will chastise the believer. Now, out of love, please know that. Now, I want us to realize why. Why is this warning important? Is it God is just simply loving to wait for people to sin and punish them? No. We pray this morning, hallowed be thy name. It means, God, let your name be glorified and uplifted. God will not let his name constantly be dragged through the drain, the mud, by our sins. When we keep going on and going on and going on. You as a parent know that. There come a point you say, we got to stop this in the child, right? The child may keep thinking, ah, no, daddy, mommy loves me. They're not going to do anything serious to me. God will not let his name go down the drain by our sin. They turn the, the sacrifices into something so hateful to the people. God does it out of love. Out of love for others. If God do not act... These people that who want to worship God, they will always suffer. These people who want to learn the Word of God, they will keep not having the Word of God. God does it out of love for others. God does it out of love for you. Stop it. To stop it. So that is one warning. There is a limit. Now, I'm not saying that you will be cast into hell if you're a true believer. Please don't misunderstand me. If you have genuinely turned to Christ, you have turned, turned to Christ in repentance. You have known the change, the transforming work of God in your heart. Yes, you'll be saved. And sometimes that is the problem with us. We think, I'm going to heaven. It's okay. It's okay. I just want to go to heaven. We do not care about the name of God. We do not care about the consequences it causes to other people. Well... God is not a derelict father like Eli. Eli would just let the sons go on and on and on and on and on. God the father will not do that. He is not a bad father. All right? So that is the first warning. God will act at some point. Then the second one leads, it leads to the second thing. The last straw may be just around the corner, my friend. The last straw may be just around the corner. Eli told Samuel, right? Now, before that, in chapter 2, God had already sent a prophet to him and told him what he was going to do. Now, when Eli told Samuel, tell you are, if you're trained to be a priest, trained to be a judge, trained to be a prophet, well, you better learn this lesson. Say everything that God says to you. But I don't think that Eli fully expected that Everything that Eli, Samuel was going to say was all about Eli. This was that final straw. You know, sometimes we keep ignoring sins. We keep going on and on in it. We don't think that there's a limit to God's patience with us. God will remove you, right? Even death in Eli's case, Eli's children's case. God warned in, in 1 Corinthians 11, don't keep presumptuously coming to the Lord's table. Um, take of it unworthily. We are never worthy to, by ourselves, all right? But we presumptuously continue in sin. Don't do that because God says some are sick and some are dead. You do not know when is the last straw. Do you realize that God has already, already initiated things? All this while, waiting in patient, in, uh, waiting patiently, for Eli to repent. But it came a point, he started, all right, it's time for Eli, uh, for Samuel to be born. The, the mechanism has started. But Eli kept thinking, all is fine, continue in that. Well, Eli, uh, Samuel is born, Samuel is my servant, doing things for me. Just, I just tap my sons on their wrists and that's it. Eli did not know. It's just around the corner. Now, Christians, when we continue in that, not only do not think that God's li God will not, God is limitless, limitless meaning to say He will not act, but the action may be very soon. It may be next week. It may be today. So God will act. So finally, God says, 
please tell him that, look at verse 12, in that day I will perform against Eli all things I have spoken concerning his house. It's going to start. It's going to start. And it starts now. So from here on, later on we read in the later parts of Samuel, you will see God's God acting again and again and bringing everything to pass. It has started. So Christian, please don't be foolish to think that this goes on and on. Well, then it leads to the, the third warning, the third warning. Beware when life is good. Beware when life is good. You see, for, for Eli, life is really good because as a high priest, his position is super secure. No one can remove him, of course, except God. No, no human can re remove him. It is God appointed. Only God can remove him. So his life was super secure, humanly speaking. Now, is that why sometimes we continue in sin? Well, you know, in this job, it's secure. They need me. Right? My big boss loves me. I have the abilities that, that no one has and they need me. When life is good. The son's life were good. You know, for the children of the, pri for the priest, they do not have to worry about their meals because the sacrifices, part of it is assigned to them. And they are commanded to constantly bring the sacrifices to God for sin, for thanksgiving, and so on, for peace, and so on. So their life is set for life. So they too, set for life, you know. My father is not removing me, so I continue in sin, in, 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 in gluttony, in abusing the sacrificial system, in fornication. I just live like that because life is so good. Now, Christian, that is sometimes our problem. The warning is this. When life seems very smooth and peaceful, number one, you think, I've been living in this sin for so long, nothing has happened. No, it's the patience of God. God gave Eli so many years. He's an old man now till now. Don't, don't think that, well, nothing has happened. Teens, are you committing certain sins secretly and you say, all oh, this is nothing happened? Adults likewise. Don't think that it won't be just around the corner. Something can change overnight and totally be trans... Your whole life will be turned upside down overnight or in the years to come. So beware. Beware when life is good. You seem secure, provisions are happening, peace is there. Well, you feel, you feel um, nothing can go wrong in your life. That is the most dangerous. Now, let me read to you Romans 2, 4 to 5. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? Do you despise that and continue in it and don't deal with it? Do you despise his long suffering, his forbearance, his goodness? not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So God says, the reason why I have not dealt with you and I continue to let you have a peaceful life with providence in your life and so on, is not because I'm closing one eye and intend to let you go on in it. My goodness is to lead you to repentance. Every time you take the Holy Communion and you think of the sins that you ignore and will not deal with, God is saying this, don't think that all, is, will, all, all will always be well. It's my goodness. Every time you ponder upon Christ dying for you, you ponder upon His great love for you. They say, how can I be so ungrateful? His goodness, His long-suffering is to lead you to repentance, not lead you to continue to repeat the sin. No. This is a warning. And it says, Romans 2, 4, uh, 2, 5, but after the hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Do you want to wait for that? Continue to ignore with a hard heart, impenitent. Now the warning is this. God says you treasure up. means when you think that you can keep going on in it, you are compiling sin. When God allows you to continue and have not dealt with you, it's not for you to compile sin. It's for you to repent. It's for you to change, turn back to Him. Chance and chance again, He's giving you that. So the longer you and I refuse, the longer you and I ignore, we are compiling this against ourselves. Well, if you're not 
a Christian, not a believer. You have heard the gospel many times. God again and again sent messengers, whether draw you to church or your friends telling you or that you hear a message in the church again and again that you are a sinner. Turn from your sin to God and He will forgive you. Salvation is by grace. And after that, live an obedient life to Him. He loves you. He wants you to live in fellowship with Him and to be useful in this world and to have an eternal life. You hear that again and again. But you say, well, life is good. Maybe next year, maybe next time. Let me enjoy my sin for a little while more. You do not know. When the judgment is coming, it may be today. That is what God says in His Word. His goodness is to lead you to turn to Him for salvation. Same for the believer. Don't presume upon the patience and the long-suffering of God because even in the New Testament, in Romans 2, it makes it very clear. Do you despise the riches of His goodness and forbearance and long-suffering? Do we? Don't. Don't. All right, so these are key warnings. We have the attitudes. We have the warnings for us to take note of. Now then, we think about, well, the consequences of ignoring sins. If you say, well, uh, these warnings, I'm still going to ignore these warnings. Life will continue as it is. Well, please know that sin has consequences. Please understand that. Well, here, the consequence can be severe, very severe. So first one, the consequences can be pitiful. Look at second, uh, First Samuel chapter 2. These consequences can be Number one, pitiful. It makes you get into a very pitiful state. Chapter 2, verse 36. Now God says, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's office, that I may eat a piece of bread. The children, the sons were living in absolute gluttony. They abused the sacrifice for themselves. But God says, now you continue in your sin. You will be reduced to a pitiful state. Well, I have everything now. What pitiful state? Please do not think that God who gives all things cannot remove all things, however secure you feel. They will beg for a piece of bread. The priests were always seen as the most um, treasured, respected gift of God to them. Right? And they treasure the priesthood because the priesthood enables them to um, draw close to God and know God. They were respected for that. But when they abuse it, they don't, they don't care, they continue in their sin, you'll be taken away. My friends, what is it in your life that you feel that well, I will continue in this dignity. Now, please turn to chapter 3, verse 11. Chapter 3, verse 11. I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. Everyone and both ears of everyone. How pitiful it will be. It will be very shameful. It will be very shameful. Do not think that you can keep committing certain sins well, it's secret. No one knows. Or I will get away with it. I'm secure. Christian, don't be so foolish. God can expose it. God can make it known to the world to teach us a lesson. Now, why does God do this kind of thing? Parents, please don't think. I will do that. Shame my children publicly. God is not doing that for that purpose. God says that if he don't deal with sin, then Israel will not fear. Israel will not learn. Now, please remember, by Eli's time, they have the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, God made it very clear. Now, if anyone have a stubborn son, a stubborn or rebellious son that will not obey the voice of his father or his mother, when they have chastened him, and will not hearken. Then his father and his mother will lay hold on him and bring him onto the elders in the city. All right? And then the stubborn and rebellious, 
They will say to the elder, the stubborn and rebellious son will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men on the city shall stone him with the stones, with stones, that he die. So, listen carefully. Why does God do that? Not, not to, just to shame someone. So shall they put away evil from among you. Number one, God will not let evil continue to live in the church, in you, in your family, so that they will put evil away. Number two, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Shall all Israel shall hear, both ears, they will tingle and they will fear. God wants others to fear. Why? When we fear, we will stop sinning. You see, the Christian should always have reverential fear of God. Don't sin. Also, rather, restrain ourselves from sinning because we have a reverential fear. We love the Father. We do not want to grieve Him. We love Him too much to grieve Him. Reverential fear. But in this reverential fear, there must also, when we continue in sin, this tingling, trembling fear, because that is what will stop us. Heed the warnings. Don't keep going on and on and on and think that God, there is no need to have any trembling fear about God when we continue and continue in known sin and will not deal with it. So it will be very pitiful, it will be exposed, people will know. Your name, your name is not as important as God's name. Why does God say, if the elder sin, right, and refuse to repent, the pastor sins and refuse to repent, what does God say in Timothy? Approach him, talk to him, and he still refuse to repent, then make it known to the congregation. Why? Why? So that the congregation know, number one, this is sin. It must not be present. We must not commit that. Number two, there will be fear. We will not do it anymore, and the church will be saved. So repent, repent, all right? So, so number one, shameful. It can become very pitiful. Number two, the consequences of sin when we keep ignoring sin is found in chapter 2, verse 34, all right? Verse 34, and this shall be a sign unto thee and shall, uh, and shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall both, they shall die both of them, See, round the corner. One day, both of them. Now, it will be not only very pitiful, it can be very painful. Painful. In one day, both of them will die. And they will die to get in one day. So, do you know how painful it is for the father to hear that? The very thing that he loved more than God, he loved more than God. Be clear about that. God says that. He honored them more than God. He will not restrain them. The very thing that you love, well, God will have to take away. See, God graciously bestows many gifts, abilities, children, possessions to us. In His grace, He bestows them for us to use it for Him, but we continue to abuse it. We continue to live in sin. Won't deal with it. God can remove them all in one day. Could be your health, could be your children, could be your possessions, could be your job, whatever it is. Now, please, I want to repeat and again and again. God is love, and He does a lot of these things out of love, not only for you, but for others. Permanently Now, the, when we keep ignoring, 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 some painful thing can happen to us. Don't wait till then. Now, the third one, the third one, it can be very permanent, permanent. Now, chapter 2, verse 31, these are all the prophecies he gave. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, and there shall, be, uh, there shall not be an old man in this house. I will cut off. Means it is permanent, cut off. Not temporary, but permanent. Now, God, for some reason, along the way, moved the priesthood to Ithamar's line. That is the line where 
Eli came from. His goodness, his graciousness, he did that. Instead of being grateful and thankful for this great privilege, Eli continued to ignore sin, the sons continued to ignore sins. Now, it will be the same for us. For them, it was something that will forever move. That's why the years will tingle. Seriously, you mean that will really happen? Now, think of the most unthinkable thing that can happen in your life. And then think again. It may not even be the most unthinkable thing, unthinkable thing that you can think of. It will be unthinkable to Eli. How is it possible? If God removes me, then who? Then who? I'm the only high priest and there's only one. And my children, they are the ones in line. Right? If both of them die, what will happen? Please don't be so foolish to think that God is tied to us and he has no choice. Now, that's the foolishness of ignoring sin. We think that God has no choice. God needs me. You think that God cannot remove you as a parent? God can bring up your children on his own. Please know that. Don't think, oh, God will never remove me, no matter how, what kind of parent I am. My children need me, right? God knows that. God made sure that all the, all the parents died before he brought the children into the promised land to prove to them that he's the one. Permanent, forever, forever, forever. Now, I want us to think about this. Now, we sometimes do not realize that when God says something, He will definitely do it in our lives. That is why we just keep ignoring and things seems to be fine and we continue. Now, I want you to, to notice that God says, look at chapter 3, verse 13, for I've told him, chapter 3, verse 13, I will judge his house forever. I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. Please tie this together. God's chastisement of our sins is tied to sins that we know, not sins of ignorance, all right? God will keep showing us, and once we know that it is a sin and we continue, it's no longer sins of ignorance. Now, when we will see later on in 1 Samuel, we will begin to see that, well, this man called Doak, Doak, he will kill 85 priests of Nob, at this place, 85 priests. Now, these 85 priests are the line of Eli. So, I want you to please look at verse 12, chapter 3, verse 12. In that day I will perform, I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. When I begin, I will also make an end. Now, this word should cause us to tremble. If we have known sin and we think that, well, God will abort halfway, if I, if, even if I continue in it. Well, along the way, actually, I keep sinning this sin, but nothing happens, you know. I think along the way, God, yeah, God did chastise me sometimes, but he seemed to have aborted and he's fine. Please don't be so foolish. God said, what I begin, I will make it to be an end. And true enough, it went on and on again. Later on, we will see that happen. So God will have 85 priests in the line of Eli removed, killed in one day. And in 1 Kings, we will see Abiathar, Abiathar being told by the, by the king, because of some past goodness in you, I will not kill you, but you are permanently removed. Last straw, gone. So God says, I, what I, begin, I will make an end to it. So don't be foolish to keep ignoring and think life is fine, I can keep going on. But God has already begun to act and he will see it through. Now it's very sad that sometimes when we keep thinking that when we um, go on and on, nothing will happen. So these are the three things, all right? The consequences of sin, it can, it's very severe, it's pitiful, it's painful, and it can be very permanent, once and for all. Don't think that the chance will keep coming back. Don't think that. Don't think that. Now, then the last part, the last part. Are we ignoring sins in our life? 
We know the kind of attitude we can have. We need to watch that. We, I hope by now, see the warnings. It's not limitless, God's patience. We see the consequences of ignoring sins. Now, we have to ask ourselves, are there sins in our life that we are simply just ignoring? Well, first and foremost, understand this. God, at the same time, was showing that there will be a true prophet. There is no use having true prophet. There is no use wanting um, faithful preaching from pastors when you intend to ignore sins. I'm only going to selectively hear. So that's the first thing. Are you one that is a selective hearer? I want to attend a sound church, but when I'm in a sound church, I will pick and choose what I want to obey. Some things, uh, not now, God, maybe later, all right? Later, later. Don't be foolish. God gave true prophets so that you will know what are your sins. So that when you know what are your sins, you will stop. You should stop ignoring it. Start dealing with it. Restrain yourself. Or as parents, restrain your family. And so that you will avoid the consequences. That is why God gives true prophet. You defend. You keep saying the Bible is without error. We believe in the Bible without error. We attend churches that, that propound that. What good is a Bible without error means this is a very faithful book that you can trust and every single word of it will not drop. You can trust in it, but you would not obey it. Along the way, God, I keep saying, will take you through progressive sanctification. Please know that. There will come a time when you begin, God will begin to show you, now you are ready to learn that this is sin. Yes, you have been obeying in this, but not perfectly, not well enough. And I'm going to show you some things in there. It could be your family life, it could be your personal life, it could be um, your work life, whatever it is. God will show you now the level of obedience that is expected in this area. And they say, but no, this is my limit. I would not obey beyond this. Then what good is there for you to attend church? I'm not telling you not to attend church. I'm telling you to respond rightly, all right? Now, then the next one, all right, the next one is, am I, am I ignoring sin? Number one is, am I being selective hearer, hearer, all right? Number two, what are some of the sins you are ignoring? First, let's see from the passage. Well, parenting. Eli failed as a father, spoiling your child. Now, Eli, do you say, but Eli scolded the children. You look at chapter 2. Didn't he say, oh, why are you doing this? That kind of thing. But I want you to know, you hear Eli saying that, but I want you to know what God says about Eli. Now, God says he knew his sin, but he did not restrain them, meaning to say whatever Eli was saying, he was not serious. His intention was not to restrain them. He just say something, that's all. Perhaps he's afraid to go to the stage, to offend the children, displease the children. Parent, are you like that? You know, sometimes as parents, I hear parents say, yes, look at some parents, um, my friends, you know, they, 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 they cane their children or they scold their children. They are not serious. You know, they're just going through the motion, but you know that they love them so much. They, they have no heart to really chastise them. No heart to do what is necessary because it will displease the child. They're afraid that the child don't love them anymore. You say, ah, they're not serious. We know that. Well, you have to ask yourself, are you such a parent? You are not serious about restraining your child. You let them do what they want to do. But you will say something. You will tap them. That's it. Now, you know, when you are parenting like that, as you've learned in family, family seminar, it is very dangerous because your child will sense you are not serious. Children have a uh, I don't know. She uses seventh, eight, nine, tenth sense, all right? They know what is serious and they know what they can keep doing and they will still get away with it. You are not serious. Perhaps this is why Eli's children became what they are when they grew up. <laughs> Dad is not serious. Yeah, he will just keep saying these are things. Silly old man, just ignore him. From young, he never does anything that is serious to stop us. 
God says he did not restrain them. So whatever words he used, he was not serious. Are you, are you having that problem? Do you know when you do not restrain your child from sin? The definition of God is that. Look at chapter 2. Look at chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, verse 29. Chapter 2, verse 29. Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honours thy son above me. Verse 30. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel has said, I shall indeed that they, and, and so on, uh, and for them that honour me, I will honour. So this is about honouring God. When you do not restrain your child as you seriously ought to, when they sin, when they dishonour God, please don't just think uh, nothing. I, I just think chastise them as I should when they've come to a stage that they repeatedly do it. It's nothing. No. You are honouring your child above God. That is all. That is a simple definition. When we spoil our children, now, are you a parent that is so afraid of offending your child, but you're not very concerned about offending God? Your child doesn't want to come to worship. That's why you're always late. Never mind. Better late than, than the child doesn't want to go. Never mind. Just be late. Do you honour your child more than God? Afraid of your child more than honouring God? Your child doesn't want to do certain, doesn't want to come to church or whatever it is. Uh, they don't want to come, so we don't go as well. All right? Do you honor your child more than God? Do you spoil them? Spoiling your child is basically that. But we warn. We warn. There are warnings, there are consequences. It's reached a stage where the children, they make themselves vile. Yes. Yes, they make themselves vile, but God said the reason is Eli did not restrain them. Now, the second, so are you that kind of parent? You need to search your heart very carefully. Learn, learn. Number two, are we guilty also of this sin? Refusing to submit, stubbornness. Refusing to submit to the message of God, to the admonition, to the exaltation of God in His Word or through messages. Are you? The children were. The high priest spoke to them. Just ignore. God sent the high priest. All the while, they knew what was the right way. They did not care. Stubbornly continuing in your sin. Ah, pastor always say the same thing. Ah, parents always say the same thing. Ah, the attitude in your heart. You may not raise your hand. Now, God says that in verse 12, chapter 3, verse 12, in that day I will perform against Eli, Eli all the things which I have spoken, which I have spoken and he knows. Repeat messages. Sometimes repeat messages are God's mercy. Again and again telling you what the doctrine is. Again and again God telling you what the sin in your life is. Repeating to you, I have told you. So please be careful of stubbornness. Refusal to listen to the word of God. Well, what else? Irreverential worship. Are you and I ignoring that? The sons, they abuse the sacrificial system. People came to worship God. And they abused the system. When you come, Sunday after Sunday, do you have the, children, the sons, Eli's son's attitude? It's just a worship. I do what I want. You know, at one point we were so distressed Parents, because we, we had to use the upper fellowship hall, they will come for worship halfway through, go out to McDonald's, buy McDonald's, come back and sit down there and eat McDonald's with the child while worship is going on. Why? Because the child wants McDonald's. That is all. What is your heart in reverence when you come to worship? Maybe every Sunday, you just, it's just a worship. Like the sons, just, just worship. What is that? I do what I want. You come here every Sunday, well, intending to sit there and go zonk, blank out, and then just, oh, actually quite good. Every Sunday morning, although I wake up early, I can sleep from 10.30 to 11.30. Just go there, but you just, you know, dream of things. You don't care about worshipping God. You fall asleep. Week after week, you don't care. Week after week, nothing happened to me. Please, don't take worship of God lightly. 
Number three, uh, I think I meant number four. What other sins can be, that we can be ignoring? Ignoring. Pride. Pride. In life. These sons, we are high priests. You better give it to me. If you don't get it, we will take it by force. Do you know who we are? We do what we want. Pride. When we serve God or when we do something or when God gives us a certain privilege in life and we, take and, we, and we are proud of it, whether it's in service or whether it's abilities, and you keep going on, you know, you, you do something and you keep still showing off and keep very happy that, that people admire you or whatever it is for your gifts or your talents or for, 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 for some service, please don't think that God will not remove the privilege once and for all. You continue and you continue and you continue. The, the, whatever it is that God gave you, God did that. God did that. Permanently. We learned. Are you proud of your child? Hmm? My child is this, talented, and so on and so on. Now be careful of that. Well, I do not know whether Eli had that, but well, how would you feel if your child is somebody? Whether in the ministry or whether in the, in the secular world, somebody. Somebody. Therefore, you don't, don't make sure you, you, you honor your child. There's somebody, you know, in this world. Be careful of that. Don't keep going on in that. Well, what about Aniko Yok, the sons of Eli? They would look for these loose women outside the temple. We studied that in the earlier week, in chapter 2. They have no qualms about it. Christian, are you, are, are you in any unequal yoke? Are you? Whether it's a boy-girl relationship, just don't think about this. Just don't think about this. I'm safe, I'm going to heaven. Yeah, I know this is wrong, but I just continue in it. Don't think about this. Don't restrain yourself. Don't stop it. Well, no one may know, teens or even adults in your workplace or outside the church. No, your daddy mommy doesn't know as well. Are you having these things in your life? Please don't think that, well, all will be fine. All will be fine. Now, the next one. What about hypocrisy? Hypocrisy. Very common with us. Well, in a sense, Eli was really having double standard. He expects Ruth, uh, he, he expects um, um, Samuel to, to be a certain, to live in a certain way, but he did not expect his children to be that, or himself. So you can keep going on living like that, parents, young person. Now what about secret sins in your life? Secret sins. No one knows, not yet, even your spouse, Maybe at work, flirting with someone. Maybe in church, having adulterous thoughts. Never mind. It's okay. As long as he or she doesn't know. And go on and on. Please remember the warnings. Please remember the consequences. Now, some sins that pastors, elders commit is permanent. They will be removed permanently, defrocked. I'm sure many of them Many of us do not think that it will happen, it come to that stage. Now, lastly, lastly, or I say secret sin, don't wait till God have to expose you. Don't wait till God have to spread to all Israel to know so that Israel will fear. Don't wait till God have to expose it to the whole church so that the church will also, whoever is sinning your sin will stop. Well, lastly, what about the church? What about the church? Is the church one that is seeking to please men only? Afraid to displease the hearers, the congregation, give them what they want. And even when you preach against something, it's not serious. Will not make changes in the church, will not act. Worse still, there are certain people you want to please in church or you're indebted to. We learn about the true prophet, right? The false prophet will, well, even preach messages that will support that lifestyle. Why? To please men, right? To please men. 
Will the church, will BPCWA also be like that? Will not deal with sin. We'll just ignore and carry on and on. Now, please understand when the church deals with things. It is because of this passage. Don't wait. And this is, this is the last statement I want to make. Please do not wait in your personal life, in your family life, in your individual life, in your church life. As a church, the leaders must realize that. Please don't wait until God has to act. I want to repeat that. Don't wait till God has to be the one who act. When God says, He knew but He did not restrain, what is God saying? When you know, you restrain yourself, you restrain your spouse, you restrain your child, you do it. Because when you wait until I have to do it, it will be very severe. Because I want to avoid that very severe stage, that pitiful, that painful, that permanent kind of situation. I ask you to act. In other words, I ask you to repent. Deal with it. Don't keep ignoring it. I want you to avoid that part. But when you don't and you keep ignoring sins, then that part will come. It will come. Notice that Eli said that it is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his what seems good to me. It is the Lord. Capital L O R D. Eli understood one thing. God is a covenantal God. That is covenantal name. God promised blessings for obedience. God also is faithful when he promised chastisements for disobedience. God has to act. So, Christian, I hope that we search our hearts. We search our hearts today. Lord, what is it there? Is, the, is that final chastisement just around the corner? Is it just around the corner? Lord, help me. I want to deal with it in my life, in my family, in the church. Now, Lord, let us rise to ask God to search our hearts. Let us sing hymn 246. 200 and, sorry, 247. 247, shall we rise and ask God to search our hearts? 247.